Okay. In Hi, could you speak about Pandamal violence history? Right. In understanding what happened in Kondamahal in 2007 to 8, I would say there is many levels to it. And the levels even have a long history. For example, if you see the violence, the form it took, of burning houses, villages, churches, and then you see how the British first came to that part of Orissa, they came with burning of villages. So, in a way, the violence was recreating a much older violence. That is the first point I would make, that what happened in 2007 to 8 was, it was a very manipulated violence. As a, I remember a police officer from the ST community saying to me, why are the two most discriminated communities fighting each other? And that question, you know, begs many other questions. That the manipulation at this time was basically, I would say, by... On the one hand, obviously, the Hindutva forces. The VHP and RSS had already got lists in place so that when Sarasvati was killed on the 23rd of August, and then they took his body along a very provocative route, and violence just exploded on the 25th of August. That was very obviously manipulated by the Hindutva forces, who were ready for that. But also a manipulation by the political forces, probably the BJP and BJBD in particular. <clears throat> so they had already put in place a manipulation of the two communities against each other. So this context I take for granted as, as the first point, that, and how that manipulation today echoes a manipulation 150 years ago when the British first came. How That is what power does, if you like, the manipulation of power. But some other aspects are not usually so much talked about. One is that the... It, it was not along simple lines. It was not so simple just to say ST against SC. It was also... Hindu against Christian, obviously, and the area of Kondamahal is maybe the district with the highest population of Christians in Orissa. So there is also the, in my first book, I look at the discourse of the missionaries, where if you saw what the missionaries were saying back in the mid 19th century, such Talk would now be not allowed. I mean, so completely denigrating of Hinduism, completely denigrating of the tribal. And in a way, I would say the VHP and RSS, they are modelling themselves on that kind of discourse. It's very un easy to understand the reaction uh, against Christianity from that. So that reaction, one aspect would be the Christian organisations had very heavy funding within Kondamahal. So, of course, they were spreading a lot of education that, in some ways, very enlightened, but it was coming along Christian lines. So you can understand the backlash against Christians. This is very difficult to say because, obviously, the Christians were the main victims in this violence. So, but what has given grounds... What gave grounds for such... Um, infiltration by the Hindutva forces in Kondamahal. Then also going along with that, one of the particular uh, triggers for the violence of the Kond Adivasis against the Essis and against the Christians is the um, Kui-speaking Adivasis, the, the, the Kui-speaking uh, Panos or uh, scheduled caste people, their first language is Kui, the, is the tribal language. Then they wanted to be recognized, instead of being recognized as an SC, to be recognized as an ST. And this infuriated some of the Adivasis. Number one, because 
they're protective of that ST, ST status. Number two, because the land grabs that are going on in Kondamahal, in all the Adivasi areas, they're basically from the higher castes. But there is also land grab happening from the SC side. Um, and number three, because, because of those other two reasons, the Adivasi organizations had been infiltrated by the VHP and by the Hindutva forces. So, and in that sense, just like in Gujarat, when, if you like, the, the horrendous killing of Muslims was very much orchestrated by taking in Adivasis to attack the Muslims. So, in Kondamahal too, there is that element of the Hindutva forces orchestrating the Adivasis against the Christians in particular. <clears throat> so these are certain of the very complicated historical fault, li fault lines that were being orchestrated politically. But there's another aspect that a friend of mine had an interaction with Sarasvati, the VHP ideologue who was murdered in 23rd of August 2008. And Sarasvati was killed in an ashram near Tumaribund. And this area of southwest Kodamahal was just next to the mountains in where the Kutia Kons are living, if you like, the most traditional section of the Kons in Kandamahal. And those mountains, just like Niamgiri, they have cappings of bauxite. So Sarasvati had talked to my friend, maybe this is 20 years ago or something, he understood that the mountains were sacred to the Kond people. And that is why he set up this very significant ashram there. So actually, if you go down, there are many levels to the Kond Mahavalans. One level, is that he was already going very deep into Adivasi society to try to manipulate their sentiments, if you like. And if you look after the Kondbaha violence had erupted, there was a movement apparently from civil society saying Kondbaha district is the only district that is not connected by railway. So that is why it's very backward and we need the rail connection and it will begin to integrate the people and there will be no more violence. But actually, the main reason for bringing that railway was vested interests to approach the mining of the bauxite, which actually the Kondamahal bauxite mountains have not come into the main discourse in the media. So, and if you look at what happens when you bring a railway, brings many forms of violence, huge deforestation, and actually Kondmahal is the best forested mountain there. So, I mean, already we have mentioned the mining interests, the takeover of lands, and the communal forces that is very, very strong from the Hindutva side, but in a way was also instigated from the missionary side, and that continuing through the missionary funding. But the other aspect that is very sensitive is the relationship between the SCs and the STs. And one of the things that is particular about the Kond Adivasis is that in most Kond villages, there is a very delicate relationship that goes back a very long way between the Konds and the SCs, the Dalits. And I think that's why in the Niamgiri movement now, the activists who have been there have been very sensitive to this. So you have found the Dalits have been taking the anti-mining stance alongside the Adivasis because of a kind of awareness that has come there. In Kondamahal, that element was not there. And so it's, it's like a, a potential... Um, gap between these two communities that, if you like, the cons for a long time depended on SCs to 
manage the relationship with the outside world. But then they came into a relationship of trading and then they also started exploiting and getting Adivasi land. So it's very easy to portray the Khand Mahal violence in quite simplistic terms as the Hindutva anti-Christian sentiments. But I think it's very important to understand the roots that are deeper than that, the um, why they could be manipulated against the Christians or against the scheduled castes. Can you talk about the father, the priest who was murdered? I think his family itself was murdered first. Something Could you start from the beginning, how well, it started? And um, what was the missionary doing in Kandamala? Okay, going back to particularly Sarasvati, there was, I think, the violence really started in a big way in December 2007 when there was an attack on Sarasvati and that's when the first churches were burnt and there was some also Christian violence towards the other side. So Sarasvati was a very inflammatory talker, very Hindutva. So Sarasvati, he was the Swami who was killed. Sarasvati, Swami. Yeah. He's from which caste? I don't know his caste, but he had been um, preaching within Khand Mahal for more than 30 years. And he is a member of the VHP. You could say he, hardcore Hindutva, as it were, trying to stop hit Christian conversion and to try and what the, he would call reconverting to Hinduism, which is as much a, a narrow-minded and um, communal thing as the Christ Christian conversion. So when he was attacked, or supposedly attacked in December 2007, that began the violence. When he was killed by probably a section of the Maoists and there was an attack on the ashram, they killed him and three or four of his followers. Then that was used as the VHP for the, as a means to really orchestrate attacks on Christians. So this Maoist killed Saraswati, that is true, that is established. Why did Maoist do that? Well, in a way they understood correctly this man was very inflammatory, he was a very bad influence, he was inflaming sections of society against Christians or against along caste lines. But after that violence, long spread violence took place, where many Adivasis and Dalits were killed. Exactly. But uh, that was a, it wasn't that, uh, that is not the right way of... Putting. It was a very stupid thing to do and I believe there was a division in Maoist leadership because of that, that um, I think in that sense the Maoists have been relatively restrained in the violence and for exactly this reason because if you kill uh, a Hindutva ideologue it's the most inflammatory thing you can do and it gives the other Hindutva forces just the chance they're looking for to inflame the situation. Okay, then, so that if Maoists are killed, why did the Saraswati, the VHP go after Christians? They should have gone against Maoists. You see, many of the um, Maoist cadres, it's like maybe if you look at the history of naturalism also here in Andhra Pradesh, maybe among the first recruits were Adivasis, but were also scheduled castes. And maybe in the early years there were more scheduled caste proportion, I don't know. So within Khand Mahal, many of the Maoists might come from community. So although you might think Christianity and Maoism are two completely different ideologies, but actually um, there might have been a kind of convergence quite often. So I mean the Maoists would understand like many of us would understand what Sarasvati was doing was a bad thing, was very inflammatory, but... Which, uh, which Christian they were? Uh, Roman Catholic, Protestants, like that? Which... I mean I cannot answer that question because if you look at the British policy towards Christians, and this is something I study in my first book, I, I, I like to think the chapter I wrote on, Christ, on, on Christian missionaries in my first book was one of the most in-depth studies that has been of Christianity and conversion. And if you like, originally the British in India banned missionaries because they were traitors. They were here to exploit India, very frankly. and. 
Krishnis would muddy the waters and they would confuse that. So they did not allow them until 1817. Then when they allowed them, gradually they said to Christians, the missionaries, okay, you can come into the tribal areas and you can take over health and med uh, education. And they divided up the tribal areas. So even among the cons, one area they gave Roman Catholics around Sorada in uh, on the edge of Kondmahal, what's now Ganjam district. One area, like in Bissamkatek, area they gave to the Lutherans. Another area, especially influential in Kondmahal, the Baptists. Church of England is another area. They literally divided up the tribal areas among the different Christian sects. And the um, missionary organizations, they really took over health and education. On the one hand, as a genuine benefit, they wanted to give civilization, they wanted to give the benefits of civilization. But on another, they said very frankly, through the hospital is the best preaching ground. The school is the best place to undermine Hinduism and to undermine the traditional religions. They, they tended to see the tribal religion as kind of a clean slate, but gradually they understood they weren't. They saw them as very superstitious. So they used schools and hospitals as places to try to undermine the traditional religions. And I've, for example, I've met a um, somebody who witnessed this, and this was up in Himachal or somewhere, where just a foreign person who was working alongside an NGO, because NGOs have taken on this model. NGOs also use health and education as the two main medium. And just this foreign person was witnessing how these Christians, they were coming to the bed of a Hindu who was there lying in bed and saying, we will pray for you. So the Hindu, he put his hands together and said, I